Um, good morning, uh, Commissioner, uh, Mr. Justice, as well as um, the youngsters. Uh, it is actually my great honor to be here, not as a speaker, but as a moderator. My duty is actually very minimal. I just try my very best to make sure that we have a very natural and also smooth flow regarding the speakers and also some of the highlights. I will also prompt them regarding some of the uh, important issues uh, surrounding the core principles of integrity. Uh, today we have a very good mix between speakers and students' representatives. If I may introduce the three speakers, even though they need no they need no introductions for as far as Hong Kong students are concerned, but in case for our overseas friends, if you don't know them, if I, uh, I, I, I will introduce them briefly regarding their bio and also their credentials. The first one is Mr. Bernard Chan. He is also the organizing committee chairman for this event. Uh, Mr. Chan is a deputy to the National People's Congress of China and a non-official member of Executive Council of the Hong Kong SAR government. He was a member of the Hong Kong's Legislative Council in 1998 to 2008. He graduated from the Pomona College in California and is the president of Asia Financial Group and Asia Insurance. Regarding his community services, Mr. Chan is the chairman of the Advisory Committee on Revitalization of Historic Buildings, the Council for Sustainable Development of Hong Kong, and the Council of Social Service, deputy chairman of Oxfam Hong Kong, etc. He also serves as the chairman of the Lingnan University Council and the Hong Kong Thailand Business Council and is an advisor to Bangkok Bank, Hong Kong branch. Our second speaker is Professor Stephen Chen. Professor Chen, President and Chair, Professor of Public Policy, joined the Hong Kong Institute of Education in 2013. He was Dean and Chair, Professor of Finance, School of Business at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Professor Chen was also convener of the Business Advisory Committee at the University. Professor Chen is highly active in academic research, focusing on corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, and financial market development. And he also publishes widely in international refereed journals. Professor Chen has actively participated in a wide range of community services, including supervising the, the, the in, including chairing the supervisory committee of the Asian Bond Fund, Hong Kong Bond Index Fund of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Nursing and Midwifery Subgroup of Steering Committee on Strategic Review on Healthcare, Manpower, Planning and Professional Development. Actually, I, I need to have another breath, uh, which is a very long one for, for Professor Jung, an overwhelming bio. Uh, he is also, uh, so he also serves as a member of the Hong Kong Committee for Pacific Economic Co Cooperation and the Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Fund Task Force. Um, and he also serves as a member of the Commission on Polity. So you can imagine how, how wide the interest of uh, Professor Chen has been, including uh, uh, corporate finance, corporate governance, as well as healthcare and also poverty management. Uh, last year, Professor Zhang held a number of other public services and officers, including chairing the consultation panel of West Kowloon Cultural District Authority and part-time member of the Central Policy Unit. I wonder whether uh, Professor Zhang has any spare time for your family. <laughs> um, last but not least, uh, our third speaker is Mr. Dick Lee. Mr. Lee joined the Hong Kong Police Force in 1972 as a probationary inspector after graduating from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was promoted to the rank of superintendent in 1981, chief superintendent in 1992, assistant commissioner of police in 1995. His appointment as commissioner of police was effective from the 10th of December 2003, and he retired in January 2007 after 34 years of service during which time he worked in a variety of posts in both crime investigation and general uniform branch policing. Upon his retirement, Mr. Lee became the executive director of the Hong Kong Institute for Public Administration, a charitable non-profit making organization that provides management training to senior PRC officials. Uh, now, uh, 
I would like to uh, invite our youth representative to introduce briefly themselves, as well as how they participate in the areas including uh, this project, the I Relate, as well as the Youth Summit and also the ICAC Ambassador Program. So if, if I may have Mark first. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark. I'm the ICAC Ambassador from the University of Hong Kong. I'm also a Year 3 student majoring in Linguistics. So throughout this year, I basically worked closely with my team to organize a lot of different kind of activities, including game booth and movie night. And uh, in the team, my major responsibility was to design uh, different kind of public publication materials like posters, like banners. And uh, throughout this year, the experience was very rewarding uh, because I was able to make an impact in the school. And a lot of my friends uh, show interest uh, in what I'm doing. And uh, they are very interested in what, uh, to know more about integrity. So uh, I, would, I would conclude my year as a, a very uh, a rewarding and a very meaningful year. Okay, thank you. Um, what about uh, Jacqueline? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline, a counseling student from Xi'an University. Uh, this year is my final year, so I really get to represent iLIC to participate in this Youth Integrity Project. Uh, as a committee member in this project, I really appreciate uh, the efforts the staff given in this uh, project. So I really hope my talents can be fulfilled uh, in this project and express my uh, talents and my creative force for you all of you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Winnie? Morning everyone, I'm Winnie. I'm studying in the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm also the current ICAC ambassador this year. My major is finance and economics. Um, in the ICAC ambassador program, I work with my team to promote integrity in campus by booth, film show, and also escape game. Working with such passionate teammates make my this make this year fruitful to me. Thank you, Winnie. Now. Uh Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Dick Lee to kickstart with our panel discussions uh, experience sharing, sharing second first. Uh, Mr. Lee, I would like you to share with our audience regarding your experience on the ethical challenges when you faced the first time when you joined the Hong Kong Police Force. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely happy to be here today because I feel much younger than so many young men and young women around me. I joined the Hong Kong police in 1972 after graduating from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. When I went home and told my mum that I decided to become a policeman in Hong Kong, my mum cried and threatened to change the lot of the threat that we live, didn't allow me to go home. Why? Because the Hong Kong police force in the 1970s or even 1960s didn't enjoy a very good reputation. It was corrupt, to some extent inefficient. So you'll be surprised why I decided to join the police. I decided to join the Hong Kong police in those days. It's only for one reason, to play basketball. <laughs> because I played basketball for the Chinese University and the coach of our team also coached the police basketball team. And because of my height, I was invited to join the police basketball team uh, in, my, in my year two, year three. And after graduation, naturally, I wanted to become a policeman. But having joined the police, particularly when I was under training at the police training school, I started to realize how important policing work was. And I was shocked to learn the poor reputation, the lack of integrity of the Hong Kong police in those days. Not until I joined one of the police stations after my graduation, I started to know why the police in Hong Kong was so badly uh, commented on. I was in a small team leading 40 men and women looking after one shift in a station. And in my station area, there were street gamblings, drug activities in the street, 
very obvious offences and crimes committed, but nobody cared, including police officers. I remember the first arrest I made was a drug addict. When I brought him back to the police station, the duty officer looked at me and was shocked that, Inspector, why did you make the arrest? I said, well, I saw him commit an offence, I, 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 I saw him being suspicious, I stopped and searched him and found a packet of heroin, a suspected heroin, so that's why I brought him back to the station. I said, Inspector, your job is not to, to make arrests, your job is to supervise your men and women, and they would make the arrest. It's not your business. I talked to my team, and they all said, well, we always turn the blind eye because we were not encouraged to do this, we were not encouraged to do that. And obviously, people, or officers at the police station, uh, were getting benefits from these um, criminal activities. I remember my first lesson to learn of being a straightforward and uh, honest police officer was that I took a team of my staff to raid a gambling establishment, an observation that we had been carried out for weeks and found there was a threat in the station area where we suspect to be gambling diving. So I obtained a, a gambling authorization or gambling warrant from my boss and raided the place and arrested 60, of, 60 offenders there with gambling equipment and money. And after that, the next week, I was transferred to the police technical unit, miles away from my station, up in the north of the New Tantris, where I was trained how to use tear smoke and rubber bullets, um, then allowed to go back to normal police work. But the situation was such that frustration and evasiency of the service was seriously affected. But there was no channel to make the complaint. There was an anti-corruption branch in the police force in those days, but people tend to take away the anti and call it corruption branch. <laughs> and you know the reason why, because they were the most corrupted yeah. uh, department within the police. Fortunately, in 1974, as one and a half years after I joined the police, ICAC was established, and we had a channel. We had someone in the in the, in the territory who fry the fact of anti-corruption, who uphold integrity, who keep a very close watch on the government service and to some extent the private sectors to make sure fairness. ICAC was established and changes were started in the police force. In those days, I joined the changes. But in the early years, between 1974 to 1977, there were still corruption activities carried out in the police because people thought it's another gimmick by the government. It was like the anti-corruption branch. It will become um, a toothless tiger. In 1977, I remember that the Hong Kong government announced that amnesty on people who were involved in corruption and then serious changes were introduced. Between 1977 and 19, perhaps 80s until the 90s, there were changes in the police force. And I was a member who followed changes, eventually take part in changes, and gradually led the changes in the police. I actually witnessed the Hong Kong police crawling all the way from the bottom of the valley to the day when I retired from the police and joined a very good reputation um, uh, in Hong Kong and in the world indeed. You may ask me, during my service in the police, was I ever offered any bribe? <laughs> I reserve the answer for the ambassadors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, now may I invite Stan the youth representative to ask the question. To Mr. Lee, he invited me to ask the question of whether he actually received any bribe. May I ask Mr. Lee, how do you overcome the dilemma of accepting a bribe? I was very fortunate. Uh, contrary to what people believe, the first day I opened the locker uh, in the station 
when I graduated from the training school, I didn't find a thick brown envelope. It was empty. There was no money at all. In fact, throughout my career, nobody often replied, despite arrests that I made. I presume somebody had already taken the money, and they, they already, they, perhaps they had already taken my share as well. But I was never offered right. But I said unfortunately because if I were of a bribe in those days, particularly in the early days of my police career, I just didn't know how to handle it. Because there was no education, there's no channel to report corruption. And that's why earlier I said, I was glad that in 1974, when ICAC was established, there's a formal channel for complaint of corruption. There's a formal channel to seek assistance, to seek advice on anti-corruption matters. Uh, having said that, I suspect, I suspect I had taken part in perhaps meals paid by someone, and when I asked my share, and the book, people just turned around saying, well, you don't need to pay, someone else has already paid it. So well, I suspect I had taken part in some of those meals, but not many, but not many. <laughs> Thank you for your sharing. Like, may I ask you, uh, um, do you feel very uh, pathetic if you don't get the money from the uh, corrupted college? As I said earlier, I joined the police not because of money. Although, although in those days, the police did get uh, very well paid. Um, I joined the police because I wanted to play basketball for the police team. But money to me is Never that important. I know a lot of people want more money. But I can tell you, you can never ever bring the money to heaven or hell uh, when you finish your life here. Uh, my advice to young people is that money is not the most important thing. Integrity is. Don't be the richest one in the cemetery. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your uh, so I'd like to shift. Um, our focus of discussions a bit to another uh, interesting topic, which is the challenges and opportunities of today's young people. I'm sure that this is a common phenomenon since the globalization uh, occurred in the late 1990s. Hong Kong, we have been facing a pretty high inflation. Uh, when we look at our GDP growth, it has been quite stagnant since the 2008 financial tsunami. Uh, on top of that, uh, even though in Hong Kong we don't have uh, very many universities, but, but still, uh, on an annual basis, we actually have quite a bit of university graduates seeking and looking for jobs. And then we are also facing a very high property prices to the extent that increasingly there has been some social unrest regarding young people couldn't get secured by shelter, and at the same time, we are seeing a lack of upward social mobility that may cause a lot of problems to young people when they are facing the temptation. So with that, I would say, instead of asking our speakers who have good experience, I would like to do it uh, a bit differently. I would like to ask the questions to our young people regarding what do you, what do you think, uh, now, as, a, as a university student, you will be graduating in the next year or so. Uh, you will be facing a very tough economic environment. And with that, I would say, do you still a strong believer in upholding your integrity in case you are being presented with situations in which you can be corrupted? How, how do you, how, what is your faith in terms of upholding integrity in this environment as a young people? Winnie? As a student, we may face many uh, dilemmas during, uh, in our academic aspect. Um, I think one of the challenges that young people face to nowadays is about peer influence. We are easily affected by our peers. Like um, sometimes when we are doing some projects, there may be some free riders who only show up <laughs> in the last minute. And doing the presentation, taking up the most important part, and pretending to be the leader. <laughs> that is not right. But what we will do when next time you are doing the project, you may think that, oh, I don't need to 
devote too much in this project because being a free rider can receive the same reward. But I think this is not the right thing to do. We need to uphold our integrity and to learn from, the pro learn from our process to do the projects, to do the homework. And I see this challenge as an opportunity. As we are easily influenced by our peers, I think it is a chance for us to influence others. We can uphold the integrity and then add it out and then spread the message to our peers. So that I, I think this challenge can be, uh, in other words, can be an opportunity to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I would like to uh, invite Professor Zhang to share your experience. I understand that uh, when you were young, uh, it was not easy for you to, to, to study and that eventually you, uh, you get a chance to have a further studies in France in a very u famous university. Uh, uh, how, how, was, how was it interpreted to you when, when, when you were young? Do you believe that it, 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 it has value? Um. I uh, I went I went to China Shu like like take uh, a bit uh, a bit later than take. I went to China Shu because it's not because I like to play basketball. <laughs> I can't play basketball. You can you can tell I'm much shorter than take. And I was a math student uh, when I was in China Shu, and I came I come from a very uh, grassroots family based family. I remember when I was young. Uh, my mom wanted want to want to take a driving license, and she took lessons. And she was told by her master, if she paid five hundred Hong Kong dollar, she didn't even have to go to take the test. And she refused to pay that five hundred dollar. And eventually, uh, she has never got a license until the day she died. That really uh, marked in uh, in my in my mind about the integrity about the situation, corrupting situation uh, in, in the 60s, in the 70s. Let me switch to the topics a little bit to the challenges. Um, Kelvin has described the challenges for our new generations right now. Uh, I've, I've written down three ma major challenges <coughs> for, for young generations. The first one is uh, we see the world is getting more globalized. And uh, we see uh, there is a flood of uh, money flowing around the world because of the financial crisis, because of economic crisis. And what we have seen during the past year, we see an uh, assets bubble. We see a property prices has been going up. A lot of young kids, a lot of younger generation, they've been complaining. They can't, they would never have a chance to buy a flag. Easy to compare. When I start to work, the housing prices at that time, when I started to work in the early 80s, it was about 1,000 Hong Kong dollar per square feet. And right now, we are talking about at least 10,000, sometimes even more than 10,000 per square feet. So, but the salary has not gone that much during the same period of time. So we see the gap between the poor and the rich is getting wider, particularly between the gen between the, the asset class, people who have asset and people without asset, getting wider and wider. And the young kids dream of buying their home is getting further apart, farther and farther away. The second challenge is the aging society. We have been talking about asking the, whole, the old people to stay on to their job until the age of 65 or 70 right now because uh, we see a lack of working forces, a lack of new generation to join the workforce. But if we ask old people to stay on, people like me, that really reduces the chances for new generation, for the young kids to go up in the social ladder. So they will see far more competition than our generation. The third point I'd like to mention, the first challenge is the younger generation is much better educated than my generation. In my day, the chance of getting into university, my day is about two universities. 
we're talking about one to two percent of students or high school graduate can get into university. Right now, the number has gone up to 18 to 20 percent. We see 10 times more university graduates than in the old days. And the competition started when you guys graduate from the university, when you get your certificate, your diploma from the university, your competition starts. Meaning that you, as a young generation or a new generation, you are going to have far more competitions than us. The challenge. I was, I was a dean of the business school at BU. And when we, when we train students at business school, we see them to become accountants, auditor, financial analyst, and most of them will end up having a job in the business sector, in the public sector. Some end up in the public sector as well. In the business world, there is full of temptation. I think, Kevin, you know better than me. As an auditor, when you look at the books of the listed company, and then one way or the other is, you know, the management will want you as an auditor to work closely with them, to come up with a very creative book or creative accounting, one way or the other. And at that moment of time, <clears throat> then the integrity comes into your life. You may ask yourself a question. Because of more and more competition, you want to move up the ladder. And at the same time, you have to ask yourself whether you should safeguard the integrity what you have learned in the university, what come more important, your career advancement or your professional ethic integrity. My answer is very obvious. I think professional ethics integrities come more far more important than career advancement. Another topic uh, assignment that Kevin, you didn't mention in my CV, I have been serving the ICAC Operation Review Committee for six years. And I have to confess, Commissioner, it was the toughest public assignments that I have in my life. We have eight meetings per year, every time before the meeting, every me before the meeting you have to go for a big pile of files and you go through the detail of the case. But I did learn a lot from my six years experience at ICAC. You see, all these cases, all these case files, corrupted case files, you can tell on and off one, one thing that keep repeating all these files. You can cheat one time, you can cheat twice, or you can cheat three times, but you cannot cheat forever. And one way or the other, the judges will serve you will get yourself into trouble. So my advice to the newer generation, to the young generation, when you face this kind of competitions in your career development in the future, temptation to be bribed, temptation to advance your career in a faster pace. But if you want, if you need to sacrifice your integrity, your answer should be no, no. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Jen. Now, uh, I'd like to ask Bernard a question. Well, surely given, given your uh, credential as a, a very experienced uh, business leader as well as uh, chairman of various committees in charge of cultural aspect and also humanities aspect, you have a diversified interest, but then you prove yourself that you you have been an exemplary leader in various aspects. So may I ask you uh, an advice regarding the essential qualities of being an ethical leader because we understand that ethics and also integrities are of utmost importance for a successful society. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome all the students in Hong Kong and overseas. Uh, I think those, those of us from Hong Kong, we might take integrity or anti-corruption for granted because 
as, as the, Dick put it, uh, ICAC for the past 30, 40 years have uh, really changed the, this culture for Hong Kong. So now each one of us, and even my generation, uh, I'm slightly younger, slightly younger than, than Dick, but uh, uh, I grew up uh, not really experiencing a lot of uh, this temptation, this issue for, for our generation or your generation. But, but this is Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is not just Hong Kong. We are an international city. We need to work with all our counterparts, whether it's in mainland China or Southeast Asia. And so the temptation is not just about between you and me. It's about you know, pretty much anyone that we do business with. So in the case of my business, I have operations in Thailand, in Indonesia. I know we have students from Thailand and Indonesia here this morning. So I, you know, my business are there too. And throughout the whole Southeast Asia and the mainland China. And for those of you from, from those countries, you, you know, I don't have to uh, go into detail, seeing, you know, not necessarily always uh, is black and white. You know, doing business in these uh, places, there are times where there have to be some gray area. And how do you deal with it? So even, even someone like myself, I mean, I have to address these issues daily. You know, how do you address issues where it might be a norm in these countries, in those countries, where it's not for us? Now, that is a challenge. Now, we're not just talking about some classroom case study. I'm talking about real life. And uh, I, I'm saying uh, maybe I have to uh, also do what Dick said. Uh, we, we have to do this offline. Uh, I better not uh, make it too public about it. But it's a challenge. But what I do believe, however, is um, what makes Hong Kong successful in where we are today is largely due to the fact that we uphold this integrity. Why do people come to us? Now, we compete globally. Now, why do people choose to come to do business in Hong Kong? You know, we are no, no better than most other countries or cities. And I believe one of the major reasons why people do come and choose you know, to set the base in Hong Kong is the fact that we have the rule of law, the Honorable Justice Chan alluded to earlier, because people believe in us. People, in fact, believe in our rule, our law, and the integrity. Now, this is all about perception, though. You know, uh, but the fact is up to us to deliver that. So, so this is why one thing I think is so important for us, uh, not just for textbook or lecture, is in real life. Hong Kong can only survive going forward, competing in a, in a, in a, in a global sense, is the fact that we have this you know, integrity, integrity among us. And it's important for you as a student, to, especially not just for those from overseas, but even for those among us in Hong Kong, because we tend to take it for granted. Yeah. It's only when you start to do business elsewhere that you realize that, hey, you are so lucky that you know, we have, well, first we have the ICAC here, keep reminding us how important it is, but you know, it's already somewhat embedded in our culture. But only when you start to lose it, that's when you realize, you know, how important it is. And I'm going to give you a case. You, you might think that I'm here telling you something about, oh, yeah, I don't need you to tell me this. But the truth is, and some of you may not know, in fact, most of you don't know, uh, even back in year 2000, I was talking about 14 years ago, I was being investigated by the security regulator in Hong Kong. Well, it's not, not because of something I did. It was something I did, I won't be sitting here today anymore. I will be, uh, you know, probably uh, in jail or something. But uh, what happened was one of my colleagues in my company have committed a crime. Well, actually, I don't, we're not sure whether he actually committed a crime yet because he actually left Hong Kong, disappeared. I think the police is still after him somewhere. The Interpol, the international Interpol is still going after him. But anyway, the fact that was, there was a lot of fraud behind that I didn't realize it, but I, but I was the director of that company, of that subsidiary that was involved in that, in that situation. And um, so I was investigated for two years. That two years was a very painful lesson and reminder. Because up until then, I just took for granted. I didn't think about it. 
I thought everybody would have, you know, I thought that was just, you know, I would never thought, I didn't ever think about people um, deliberately try to defraud someone or try to, you know, you know, cheat someone. I didn't think of that. I didn't. Certainly not someone within my company. And this is, by the way, you know, he's a senior executive. He's not just, you know, a junior guy. He's a senior executive. And um, so those two years was extremely painful. You know, because I could have lost all my reputation. Whether actually I did it myself, it doesn't matter. In fact, I think uh, what I was being uh, uh, penalized was the fact that uh, I did not put in enough control. You know, it's all about governance. Now, of course, um, today, after the numerous uh, Enron and so on, now the whole society is more aware of governance, especially after 2008, Lehman Brothers and so on. But this, this, this happened in 2000. So the awareness wasn't really as strong then, at least not for me. But after the two years, so anyway, I was clear. I think I was clear. They didn't have a, a proof that I actually uh, did something, have any contribution to the fraud. But boy, I tell you, I was so scared. I was so scared that my reputation, my so-called integrity, would be taken away from me, right? Because. You can imagine the next morning in the newspaper, the front page of Hong Kong would say, Mr. So-and-so, of course, uh, all you need is a headline. Probably in the detail they say, well, actually it's not me, it's my staff, but then it doesn't matter. It would say my, my company, my name on it. So, uh, and people only read headlines these days anyway, at least students too, I know, because uh, you know, you know, nobody reads the details anymore, right? So, so, so imagine losing that. Right? So only when you start to lose something that you start to really <laughs> care about it. And uh, well, it sort of happened to me. So I hope that none of you ever needs to come across that situation. You know? So it's a reminder. I mean, so don't take for granted. Don't take for granted that everyone has that integrity. You, know, you will be dealing with people that, uh, you know, gosh, you, know, you never know. So. Uh, so uh, I just thought to just tell you, in real life, in businesses, in fact, it's not even businesses. It, it, can, it can happen in anything. Uh, it can happen in, uh, you know, in any sectors. So bear that in mind. As Professor Zhang put it, integrity is the only thing left for us. And especially for this city, you know, this is what we are at best. So, for those of us from Hong Kong, uh, make sure that uh, you don't take this lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Before we have the floor for, for, for questions, I would like to ask a final question, firstly to Jacqueline, as a youth representative, regarding how do you look at money management? Of course, being a student, uh, for the time being, probably you haven't created enough wealth. But then you have to plan for your future. So, what is your, what is your value system on money management and fruitful life? Of course, put it, put any the question in the context of integrity. Are you a firm believer that once you practice integrity, in all circumstances, that will lead you to a fruitful life. And what do you mean by fruitful life? Wow, that's a long question. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as a final year student, I always want to be a financial independent because I'm the oldest child in my family, so I need to take care of my family. So I have run group that is uh, spend less than what I earn. Yeah, that's my rule. Uh, so I try to put some savings in my bank or, if, or buying some insurance to uh, keep myself uh, financially independent so that I don't need to ask my dad or my mom, uh, I need some money. I think I need to be more mature because I'm going to uh, work uh, full time very soon. So I think I, the money management is very important. Uh, the second question uh, about fruitful life. I think uh, as a student we can have a lot of opportunity to participate in uh, various uh, activities, uh, such as the ambassador program, ICC, and the uh, youth inequity project. I 
Yeah, in, in this two years, I always uh, actively participate in these social activities because I believe a fulfilled life is not just you get an A uh, in your institution or get an A in your compulsory course, but also uh, help people in need and develop your potentials in all circumstances that you like. Uh, I mean, like marketing or uh, something publicity. Uh, so. These two years, I help ICC to promote integrity uh, via my uh, social network and some marketing uh, projects. So I really like it. I, I really appreciate uh, they give me a, such a fruitful experience. And I think I did a fair job. Yeah, I think my life is quite fulfilled because I joined a very uh, a lot of social activities. Yeah. Thank you. Now, instead of asking our speakers, I would say, uh, actually, Mr. Dick Lee, he, he also he, he actually mentioned about the irrelevance regarding money. It is the job satisfaction which counts. Uh, as well as Professor Chen, he also mentioned about career. Career advancement is important, but then this is not sufficient for you to be compromised. But then I would like to ask Mark, what do you, what do you think about money management and fruitful life? What is your vision for your future? So, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say, I think many of, many of us will agree that uh, Hong Kong is a materialistic society. Uh, we tend to value success based on um, how much one uh, can be able to earn. So I've actually had a lot of uh, experience going out with friends, uh, especially those who have just graduated. Every time uh, when we're having our dinner, the first thing we talk about is how much you earn. So it's so true that uh, uh, between, between all of us, we tend to compare uh, who is earning more and who is earning less. And this is uh, a very tough challenge for every one of us because um, the first uh, graduated job, uh, it's, it's going to be very important for you. And it also will set a, set a path for you for the future career. So um, I would say this is a very tough challenge. But uh, what is more important is that we, we really need to have a very good planning and a very good budgeting because, um, as Jacqueline has mentioned, we can't really uh, spend more than, than, than we earn. So uh, that's why I think, even though we are comparing, yes, some, some, of, some of us will be earning more, some of us will be earning less, but what is important is uh, you are doing your role, you are doing your best in your job, and I think that's uh, more important. And um, talking about fruitful life, um, it's, I think it's about setting a life goal and achieving it. Uh, setting a life goal, it can be something that is of your interest. So I actually had a friend, uh, uh, she's actually studying law um, uh, in the University of Hong Kong, and uh, she's actually very interested in uh, pursuing uh, uh, in fighting for uh, women's right, um, she told me that in the future she might not be uh, she, she might not be able to be a, uh, want, want to become a lawyer, but instead she would devote herself into an NGO uh, who is uh, who actually fights for women's right, and I think this is one of the ex very good example that um, you, you 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 know your interests and then you pursue it and then you achieve the final goal. Um, as university students, uh, we, have, we actually have a lot of opportunities to join uh, different kind of extracurricular activities, uh, even like this one. And uh, through, this, through all these experiences, we will be able to find uh, our own interest. And um, uh, throughout these three years or four years right now, um, I think it's very important that uh, we know uh, our true self, uh, we know our own value, and then uh, in the future, we will be able to uh, strive on our own goals. And I think to be able to achieve uh, the own goal or life goal is, uh, will, will mean a very fruitful life. Thank you, Mark. Very good. Now, may I now open up the floor for questions? Now, I, I, will, I have to say that we have uh, two staffs uh, sitting the, standing in the back of the hall. They are, they are holding with the mic. So, uh, for those who would like to raise questions, please raise your hand and then our colleague will approach you with a mic and try to keep your question as brief as possible and also identify yourself with your name and also the school you belong to. Thank you. Do I have the first question? Oh, okay. Thank 
okay? The, the young gentleman at the, at, on, on my right hand side. Um, hello everyone. Um, um, by impression, uh, many post 80s and 90s. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can you identify your name yeah. and also the school you belong to? Okay, uh, I'm Charles. I'm the Chinese University of Hong Kong, yeah. one of the students. Uh, major in global studies. My question is that um, by impression, uh, many post 80s and 90s always uh, complain about uh, many things and have a radical response to so-called uh, uh, so called unfairness. Um, as a young people or, or any uh, anyone, uh, what is your opinion about this kind of activities? Yeah. Unfairness, emphasizing unfairness, yeah. Um. Can I? Unfairness to young people um, in the 21st century? Um, even nowadays, yeah. The unfairness? Yeah, unfairness. Regarding well, lack of opportunities? Yeah, they, they, sometimes they learn some com uh, maybe complaint, uh, emphasizing um, um, their wants. Yeah, uh, even. Yeah. Um, um, I try my. I try to. If I may twist your question a little bit, and please confirm whether this is your question. Your question is: as a university student, uh, you you are facing a lot of pressures from the society, right? Okay. Maybe maybe Professor Chen is the best speaker <laughs> to interpret your voice from the heart. I think. Uh, the the young generation right now, uh, what uh, the post 80s and post 90s, what you guys are looking at is very different from what we were looking at. Uh, the economic situation has, has changed uh, during the past four decades in Hong Kong. Uh, when I grew up uh, at a university, uh, once we finish university, we are very, uh, for, we are very keen to get a job because we have to, uh, we have to give money to, uh, to raise our own family. Our parents they didn't have very good jobs, but nowadays I think uh, the situation, uh, the economic situation in Hong Kong is much better than the old days now. What the kids, your generations, are looking at is much different now. And I would say, you know, I'm glad to see. Uh, our youngster, our younger generation are much more vocal than my generation, are much more innovative than my generation. I remember when I taught, first taught in, in the classroom and I started my, my teaching career, I remember none of my students even wanted to open their mouth, you know, to raise questions. Right now, student, blah, 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 you know, they, just, you know they, they say things, you know, they criticize me, they comment from all <laughs> angles. I think this is something that I would like to see. But I would like to urge the younger generation, uh, when once, I mean, I like them to be expressive, to be innovative, but I would like to urge the young generation to be able to express themselves in an appropriate manner. We have a lot of channels that you can express yourself. You're looking for social justice, you're looking for fairness. Done, fair. It's something that we call core value, one way or the other. But I urge the younger generation to have, to have the appetite, to have the appreciation. They may come across different opinions, different views, and to be able to have a peaceful discussion and amongst people that they may have different ideas from you. This is something that I have in mind. It's not the radical, whatever. I think uh, generation change. I think you, I, I'm seeing a generation gap now. You know, when I compare my generation with your generation. Thank you. Do I have a uh, next question? Yes. The young lady in front on the right hand side. Hi, my name is Paris. I'm from Australia and I study law and international relations. In my field of studies, we are encouraged to be competitive. It's a very tough market and to succeed, 
we have to strive to be the best. And what I'm afraid of is, while I want to be the best and be a judge, I don't want to compromise my integrity to be authentic, and I don't want to compromise the relationships I have with my peers and other students who I'm also competing with to get the best jobs. In your professions, how do you mediate the need to be competitive with also the need to maintain your integrity in being an authentic person and also maintaining those relationships with your peers? Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, for Mr. Tickley. This is a very good question, and I would like to share with, uh, with you my experience being a police officer. Um, I told you in my young days, nobody wanted to, to join the police because the police had a very poor reputation. Situation changed in the 80s, particularly now um, in Hong Kong, young graduates, men and women, queue up to join the police. It's a very keen competition, but it is a very healthy competition. I've been approached many times by friends who seek advice um, to their children who want to join the police. And my advice to young men and young women these days, when you face a competition, you must uphold your integrity because you do not want to cheat to get a job because if you get it, you will bear this bad day forever. Being honest is the most important thing. To increase your competitiveness, improve yourself, improve your quality, learn more, learn how to deal with people, try to understand more about the job, the post that you want to apply for. It's not using sort of backdoor techniques or cheating techniques to gain a job. It's using your quality, your skill to get a job. If you get that job with your skill, if you get that job with your knowledge, then you will enjoy it. If you cheat to get a job, you will never ever enjoy it because you always worry that one day somebody will discover and your integrity, your job, your future will be destroyed. I, I, I strongly echo what uh, Dick has mentioned. This is, this is the tips from my mother. And that is what, do whatever you want if you can sleep well. I'm sure that there is, there is a very rare occasion in which a man claimed to be sleeping well by cheating. So if we have uh, another question, please. Yes, the gentleman at the back of the young lady on the right hand side. Good morning, I'm Kevin. I'm from Petra Christian University from Indonesia. So uh, I would like to ask a question regarding upholding the value of integrity in Indonesia, a developing country. So how would you uphold the value of integrity in such a developing country like Indonesia, which is so different with Hong Kong, where sometimes people cheat or they do corruption. It's not because that they do not know about integrity, but it's just because they need to stay alive, just to earn income, just to have the money to eat or to have some food. So it's kind of a different situation with Hong Kong where integrity is so hard to uphold it because it's not, sometimes it's not an option, but it's a need to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. May, may, I have, may, I have, may I pass the question to Mr. Bernard Chan? <laughs> It's an excellent question. Uh, as I said, uh, it's, a question. Oh, it's, uh, it's not even a question. It's something that I have to deal with because uh, I'm actually going to Jakarta uh, next Friday um, to, you know, for my business. And I, I know exactly what you mean, but let's not go into the details of uh, what the issues are. But it is true because um, I say that the so-called so integrity is embedded in our society, but corruption, perhaps, it also may be also embedded in you know, your society as well. Now, they may not regard that as corruption. See, that's the problem, I think, it's a lot of time. In fact, honestly speaking, without the sort of uh, education I, you know, that we have in Hong Kong, I might not actually not see some of the practices as corruption in these developing countries. I didn't, in fact, I didn't think put it, uh, we probably gone through that ourselves too. You know, we walk through that journey. So bear, bear in mind that you are not alone, you know. Many countries are still walking that journey 
we somewhat somehow passed that stage, and, but we are also a smaller community. Uh, Indonesia is a much bigger country, so the and you know, the level of uh, uh, gaps, as Stephen put it, uh, Professor Chen put it, the, the the income gap is so wide. So these things can't be addressed overnight. It has taken a long time. I, I like to say this. Uh, uh, you know, we tend to look at country to country, and, and since I, I invest in just about almost every country in the region, I must say, you know, and I look at the mainland China, you know, in mainland China, of course, you know, there are corruptions too, everywhere. But I must say that uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, the leaders in Beijing, you know, has take this thing seriously. Now, they've still got a long way to go. You, you, you continue to see scandal every day you know, happening in China. But then again, it's a billion people. But they have now finally, you know, say this is it, we got to address it. Now it's not going to happen next year, it's going to take some time, but at least you put that effort you know, and determination to fix it. I think what's going to happen in China is going to have an impact in all the neighboring countries in the region. Reason for that is uh, when Hey, when you're not alone, right? When everybody else is doing it, then you think it's a norm. In fact, I think Hong Kong is not the norm. <laughs> I think Hong Kong, Singapore, perhaps maybe be regarded as, oh, you are up there, you know. But when you see such a trend happening, when, you, when all your neighbors, all your competitors are starting to recognize the issue and try to fix it, I think that, that trend will need to start to happen in your country too. Because uh, otherwise, you will be make so uh, so uh, not competitive. You know, I tell you, I go to Indonesia, and I still think that wow, things are still the way you know, somewhat it is for the past thirty years. <laughs> but but you are not on your own anymore. In the world of globalization, we compete. Everybody compete. You can stay where you are, but the rest of the world is moving, and they're moving so fast. The reason I bring mainland China to the picture because they are moving so fast. In fact, they are, you know, we are so scared in Hong Kong that we've been taken over by them too, right? So, so how can you be left alone? So I think more and more countries are recognizing, you know, the importance of of that integrity because I don't know, no one's going to come to your country to do business. If I'm a U.S. investor, you know, why do I even bother to come to your country when someone somewhere else? can offer that more assurance to them. You know, they don't have to give the, mid, you know, the middle man, you know, they, have to, you know, they don't have to uh, give bribe to get things done, if they have a choice. If they have no choice, sure, okay, maybe you know, this, you know, they'll do it. But more and more countries are, uh, you know, are changing that practice. So uh, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> it's gonna take some time, but I see the trend is happening. Uh, the question is, you know, is it going to be a slow process or a fast process? Uh, I just hope that, uh, you know, your country will, your leaders in your country will act on it. Because that's the only way to assure your country or any other countries to, to stay competitive in this whole globalized uh, world. Thank you for that. Um, any questions from the front row and on, on the left hand side? Uh, there's a young gentleman nearly at the back of the middle road. So can you please keep raising your hand so that, so that our staff can identify you? Yep, please. So you will be the next one, okay? Hello. Yes. Um, I'm Liu Wong from Harvard University. Then I would like to ask a question. Um, according to The Economist, uh, it has uh, released a chronic uh, capitalism index, uh, which is measuring a place of prosperity of uh, government business connection. Then uh, Hong Kong has topped this index. Then uh, do you think such a strong connection between the government and business center is a problem to integrity, uh, if solely based on this uh, index? Thank you. Okay. A very creative question linking 
uh, the index underpinning the success of Hong Kong to integrity. So I would like to pass it on to no one else but uh, Professor Chen. <laughs> <laughs> He's an expert in corporate finance and also corporate governance. Um, well, I would like to supplement uh, the last question and then go to the new question. Uh, I have spent some time, about 10 years ago, drafting a corporate governance guidelines for the Asian Pacific regions, including Indonesia. At that time, we have a committee uh, that composed of uh, members coming from various countries in the region. Uh, while we were drafting the guidelines, I remember uh, we have a representative from other countries in the region keep on saying that uh, there, is, there should be a cultural difference factor uh, in, uh, in the corporate governance uh, practices. Um, but again, in my view, even though we, uh, we, have, we have very cultural, our culture are very different, but when we look deep down in our own culture in Asia, stealing and cheating is not allowed it in every single culture in Asia. I think we, we, I think we, we, have, we, we have a standard, and this standard we should uphold the core value of our culture. Don't give a perception that people, uh, Asians, uh, this is the way of doing uh, business in Asia. Going back to the colonialism, um, I, I see uh, there is a problem when the business sector uh, running or going too near uh, the public sector. And we of, often we see uh, one just have mentioned in the previous presentation uh, when there is a conflict of interest, how we should deal with the conflicts of interest, particularly when you have a public sector going too near the business sector. And there's a lot of relationships going on between uh, the society, among different sectors of the society. But when you mention about this index, when Hong Kong ranked very top, doesn't mean that Hong Kong does not have any success in our economics, in, in our economy. Hong Kong economy has been going very well and in a very, very fast pace during the two or three decades. It may slow down a little bit right now, but in 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we were named it as the fourth little dragon in Asia. I see when you have a very close relationship between business sector and government sector, that could have some kind of problems. But if you have a good transparent system to show your relationship and to show what you are dealing is in a fair and open manner. I don't see this kind of communism could play a very, very uh, bad part in the business sector. As long as your, your system is transparent enough, what we have, I do believe, Hong Kong has a very transparent system and that explains our economic success during the past decades. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, we have a question uh, from the back. There's a young gentleman wearing a black T-shirt. I'm, I'm Forrest Lai, and I am from the Hong Kong Design Institute. Uh, well, it will be a tough question, I think. In recent years, there were scandals about the corruption of chief executive of ICAC. Even the chief executive of was a commissioner. Government. Sorry, not chief executive. <laughs> commissioner. But in such a tough situation, are you still confident to promote integrity in Hong Kong society and pass it to the next generation? And why? Thank you. Uh, well, didn't I just tell you just now that don't take for granted, right? Just because we have ICAC, hey, ICAC is not God. Just like any none of us. But by the way, let me tell you something. Sitting up here, it's no easy job for us too. 
because we, each of us will be held responsible. We say, oh, you are, you're here to talk about integrity. What about your own integrity, right? So I, you know, I'm actually quite nervous because uh, you know, when I walk out of this room, I may have reporters asking me, saying, did you know you have done something 20 years ago? And so, but the point is, should we know? If you don't know, you don't want to know. I, I'm sure I have done something not, I was supposed to. Uh, maybe not 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, but, uh, but uh, the fact is um, these, these things can happen to anyone. Now, of course, it's unfortunate that you know, it happens at the helm of the, the ICC, uh, but then, you know, so far no one proved there was a corruption law. But it's not even just the, whether it's a corruption or not corruption, whether you actually find the facts or not, it's a perception. It's already a very damaging act, so it's quite unfortunate. But it's, I, but I look at from I always look things from the positive side, and from the positive side, this is a it's a it's a great opportunity. It's a great reminder to us, each of us, that don't let don't don't assume anything. Don't take for granted. And I told you about my experience when it, it only until that incident that happened to me that all of a sudden I realized, wow. You know, I could have lost that too. Even though actually it wasn't involving me directly, but, yeah, but it, it involved in my company. And what is the, uh, the tagline for my company? A trusted partner in Asia. Wow, the word trusted. So actually after that incident, I was a bit worried that maybe I should take out the word trusted. <laughs> in case people come back and say, how can you call it trusted when you, when you know your staff cheated you know, and so on and so on. So, but anyway, the point is, you know, each of us, including you, each one of you, you know, we, this is our job to uphold those standards. So, uh, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not directly associated with ICAC, you know, I'm just chairing this, this event, but, uh, but I am sure all the colleagues in ICAC are doing their very best, you know, to uphold those standards for us. But it's also take us, you know. It, we, everyone is in, is in, is, has an interest in this, you know. Not just ICAC alone, but each one of us as a citizen of Hong Kong, it's our job to uphold this uh, integrity. But as Stephen, as Professor Chang put it, uh, the good thing about Hong Kong is that this is a great, amazing place with huge transparency, and that's a good. The check and balances are there, so 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 each one are hold accountable. So that's good. So uh, uh, Commissioner Pei is held accountable too. So, <laughs> right? So, so, and we, the system is uh, allow us to have that check and balance. So I have no worry about, you know, you know, we as a city continue to strive on this, on this, uh, on this high standard. Professor Chen, you would add something? Yeah, I think just very briefly, uh, from from this single incident, uh, we saw something happen that shouldn't be done. But the good part is, uh, we have a check and balance system that we award, we, we know what really going on uh, in this event. And then the next thing is, what should be done to upgrade our check and balance system? Bear in mind that there's no perfect system. And also bear in mind that every system has to be uh, periodically reviewed and updated. So I don't see Hong Kong corruption situation is going down. I really don't see. I have no connection and relationship with ICAC anymore because I'm not sitting on the committees anymore. I'm not the chairman of this event as well. I have no conflicts of interest. <laughs> but I, 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 I can say from very deep, uh, from my heart, I see Hong Kong, I still think Hong Kong as an integrity as a system in place, and I don't think that single incident actually can affect the things that our end, our integrity that we uphold uh, during the past years. And then, Mr. Digley, you have something to add? I just want to supplement on Professor Jones' mention about a check and balance system. In my personal experience, a good system needs good people to support it. There's no perfect system in this world because it's created by people, by human beings. And human beings know how to bypass it. 
But we need good quality people to operate the system. That's why we need people like you, young men and young ladies, learn the importance of integrity. Learn how to uphold integrity. This is first thing. And second thing is don't be complacent. ICAC has been doing an excellent job in the past 40 years, and they, I'm sure they will continue to do it. But education, prevention, and detection should never, ever be stopped. We must continue. I'll give you an example in the police force. Every two years, the Hong Kong police force will conduct a value workshop to educate police officers the importance of the values that they need to uphold. They must do it every two years because people need to be reminded. In whatever society, there will be newcomers. People will come and go. And you need to remind the community the importance of integrity. And you need to remind yourself from time to time the importance of integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have to bear with me and then please accept my apology and not able to allow you to ask any qu further questions because integrity is also a function of timing and then we will be close, uh, shortly closing the forum. So therefore, instead of taking more questions, I would like to wrap up by asking our speakers to give their words of advice to students and young people regarding integrity. So, if I may do it in this way, uh, Mr. Bernard Chan, please give yours first, and then Professor Chen, and then Mr. Dick Lee. Now, then I would like to finalize with finale by asking the three youth representatives to share their experience and also expectations on the society. How the society can help you as youngsters in strengthening interpreting so that you have a brighter future. So, if I may do it this way, Mark, you do first, and then Jacqueline, and then Winnie. Thank you. Well, enough is said uh, for me, so perhaps what I'd like to uh, use this moment is to uh, ask you as the leader, because the fact that you're here this morning, I mean, we were just saying earlier that on a Saturday morning, Nile class, and drizzling, and you know, why are you here? Uh, I, guess, I guess you're here because you, I guess, have some interest in this subject and you care enough to be here but there are a lot more people out there there are a lot more peers of yours so i what what i would like you to do as the ambassadors as the leader in your in your schools please pass the message on because it is so important for this standard continue to pass on from one generation to the next generation and without you the the next generation of leaders uh, the whole standard, this, this high integrity standard cannot be sustained. So I would just like to draw on your attention to uh, help us to pass this on to your classmates, to your friends, your families. This, this is all up to us. Professor Chen? Uh, I would like to supplement uh, Bernard's comments. And I think Hong Kong core value and the future on Hong Kong lies on whether our next generation, our younger generation, can help uphold uh, the core value of Hong Kong. One of the important core value is integrity. How we can how we can maintain a corruption-free society in Hong Kong to to pop, to promote Hong Kong future competitiveness. I think we, the old generation like us, have to rely on you, the new generation, to pass this, me to pass this message on and keep on the good practices and the future of Hong Kong relies on you guys. And then Mr. Dick Lee? Well, we talk about integrity, we talk about money this morning, and I would like you to mark my words. I've been a policeman for 34 years. I've seen many people gave up their integrity because of money and because of benefits. But I've not seen one who can buy back their integrity with money. Mark my words. Thank you very much. And then, Mark, your expectations on the society and also the, the relatively older people, how do we and the society help you to make a better future? OK, 
Okay, so um, I, 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 I actually see a very uh, good future because uh, uh, as all of us here, we are already taking the first step uh, into bringing a better future uh, to, to, um, to our society. Um, I think it's very important that we, uh, as ambassadors here, spread this message out and ask your friends to become ambassadors next year. And uh, uh, I think like, uh, what, what, what we can do more is that uh, we, we, sh uh, we will be able to um, listen to different people's point of view and be very critical, uh, not to blindly follow others' opinion, but to have your own views. And I believe uh, we, as the, uh, the young generation, uh, would, we would be able to have a very bright future. Thank you. And then Jacqueline? Uh, I think I think I'm going to be a full time stop Richard. Uh, so I think I need a job to fulfill my dream. Uh, meanwhile, I hope I can fulfill my talents in a creative way to express my force with uh, other people and the community. I wish I can serve the community in my spare time. Yes, thank you. My expectation towards the society to give us a bright future is about everyone should keep supporting ICAC and to report that uh, some unfairness about corruption and bribery, please report to ICAC and uh, <laughs> take this responsibility. And also one important thing is to appreciate uh, uh, people upholding integrity and try to uh, Make, make them as your role model and we can hold our hands together and step to a brighter future with our integrity upholder. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the free speakers and the free youth representative. Now it's my job to wrap up um, the panel discussion sections. My take, probably your take will be a slightly different, but my take for this morning is actually very overwhelming. I learned a lot from speakers and also from our youth representative. Firstly, as a person, we have to have integrity because integrity acts according to the value system and the beliefs that we strongly believe in. But then the first question is, as a student, have you developed firmly and independently your belief and your value system? Without which, you don't know what is integrity. So therefore, it is very important for you as a student to learn and grasp and then to choose your value system but of course not a selfish one uh, the second thing is we, you will be exposed to lots of temptations and at that circumstances and situations you may be corrupted so therefore your value system is very important for you um, as per professor Jones is saying professional ethics are of utmost importance it is even more important than career advancement, which is something in the distant future. At present, you have to be upholding interpreting. That is for sure. If I may um, use the German philosopher Immanuel Kant's saying, ethics is something that is independent of its consequence. Unlike consequentialist, ethics is something that has been determined before the actions happened. That is very important. So that um, uh, 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 for integrity, this is something which is irrelevant when it comes to money. Uh, Winnie and, Jack, uh, and Jacqueline, they share with us regarding the money management and also the fruitful future. One constraint that we all exposed to this worldly society is the constraint of our financials. Unless you're financially independent, you will be conducive to bribery and also corruptions at those circumstances. So therefore, that comes back to rule number one. What is your value system? What is your belief? That is very important. Um, Mr. Dick Lee concluded vividly that you can compromise your integrity for money, but it is an irreversible process, i.e. you cannot become rich and then buy back your integrity. The stigma will, 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 be, will stay forever. So therefore, uh, interpreting has become very important. Um, with that, I would say, uh, the final take from our youth representative is that interpreting 
has to be passed on from generations to generations. Not only us, the speakers, believe in interpreting, and we believe that you are the one who will be taking on the torch for interpreting, but it has to be passed on from generations to generations so that we can, we can build up a society which is overwhelmed by mutual trust, respect, and also interpreting, without which the society cannot sustain forever. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's the end of our section. I hope you enjoyed as much as I can, as much as I do regarding the section. Please give me, uh, please join me in, in giving a round of applause to the speakers and the three youth of the Senate.